Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, our apologies for being slightly late today. Um, this is the last seminar of the year and we've managed to have a few glitches, but I think it will be fine from now on, hopefully. Um, I'm Chris Bigby, Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre. So welcome today. Um, we've got two lots of presentations, so we'll follow the normal format that the first speakers will speak for half an hour or so, and then we'll have time for questions, then we'll have a quick break, and then we'll have the second speaker. So today is a, a sort of different type of seminar. What we have is some book authors of new books that have come out in the last uh, 12 or so months, um, talking about their books, and they're both incredibly relevant to the current climate um, of the NDIS and the National Disability Strategy and the progress that we're making in terms of rights and supporting inclusion of people with disabilities. So the first two speakers, and I'm not sure who's going to speak first, but are um, Vari Cowden and Claire McCullough, who are the authors of a fantastic book called The National Disability Insurance Scheme, an Australian Public Policy Experiment. And it's really the first sort of full book that's reflected back on on the NDIS, where it came from, what it's supposed to do and how it was progressing. So they're, they're going to uh, give an overview of the book and some of their reflections on it. So I'm going to hand over to them now. Um, off you go. Thanks, Christine, and thanks um, for having us as well. Um, my name is Claire McCullough um, and along with Vari, um, we're here to talk to you today about our new book the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Australian Public Policy Experiment. Um, I think before we get started, we might just introduce ourselves and give a bit of background about ourselves as well um, and why we thought we would write this book. Um, the presentation today, I'll give an overview of the book itself um, and some of the themes that came out through the text. And then I'll hand over to Vari, who's gonna talk specifically about one of the chapters on the NDIS and children. Um, so I am a management consultant by trade, um, but previously worked for the state government for a number of years. And one of the main uh, pieces of policy work that I did there was um, as part of the trials for the NDIS. So overseeing the early days of the scheme um, and also some of the transition and implementation issues as the scheme rolled out in WA. Um, Ari, did you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Fari. Um, so like Claire, I'm also a management consultant, uh, though fairly new to it. I spent the last 10 years before that working in state government within um, social policy and community development. Um, and before that, I was in academia. Um, I did my PhD at ANU looking at children's rights. So um, what we're going to talk about today, is sort of an intersection of two passions of mine, both um, thinking about the NDIS, but also thinking about children and their place in the world. Lovely, thanks, Barry. Um, so as Christine alluded to at the start um, of the seminar today, the book is really, uh, we think, the first um, full public policy textbook which seeks to describe the NDIS from its original concept and some of the influences that informed the, the original design of the scheme um, as documented by the Productivity Commission in its 2010 report through to the actual um, sort of political climate and environment that um, allowed and enabled the NDIS to be introduced and some of the um, challenges and opportunities that we've seen through the implementation of the scheme, which is now, I think, fully rolled out across every jurisdiction. Um, we saw through our work um, in central government, a real gap in the market for a text of this kind. So in seeking to um, write the intergovernmental agreements that underpinned the trial for the scheme, Vary and I really found that there wasn't anywhere that had sort of mapped the, the history and the journey of the scheme and then started to look at how it's been implemented from various different um, policy and practical perspectives and how the scheme has kind of intersected and interacted with other service sectors around it as well. 
So we didn't think that this was something that we'd be able to do by ourselves. So as a result, we decided to divide the book up into a couple of parts. The first um, section is really an overview of the history and philosophy of the NDIS. So that includes the trials, the transitions, um, and some of the implementation of the scheme. And those chapters are authored by Vari and myself. Um, and then parts two and three are a collection of chapters that uh, in part two look to examine how the scheme interacts with particular cohorts and sectors. So we look at um, sort of mental health and um, how it's worked for Aboriginal Australians, um, as well as some chapters about particular aspects of the scheme, like the, the fact that it's an insurance model and how the uh, scheme actuaries work to support that model. Um, and those chapters are all authored by um, what we think are some of the best minds currently writing and thinking about the scheme at the moment. Um, and then thirdly, and most importantly, includes a collection of personal stories from people with disability who've accessed or had interactions with the NDIS, as well as their families and carers. Um, and those stories are told either in their own work, words or um, with support um, from people like Christine to help to put together some of those um, stories involving people with intellectual disability, as well as some people who have psychosocial disability as well. Um, here is the list of authors that have contributed to parts of the book. I won't go through all of these, but um, we think we, we've managed to get a pretty good um, picture of how the scheme is working for lots of different groups. Um, obviously, there are some groups that we weren't able to um, find authors for, but we, we hope that this um, second part of the book gives a pretty good um, breakdown and analysis of how the scheme is working in its many different um, facets. So why, why write the book? Well, um, we, we sort of talked a bit before about the, the gap in the market that, um, that we saw around a book of this type and of a sort of comprehensive summary of the scheme. Um, we also tried to make the book cross-disciplinary, so it includes perspectives from academics as well as practitioners working across um, multiple different sectors that are interacting with the scheme, but also, um, importantly, the stories of people who are actually accessing the scheme and, and their joys and the challenges that they're experiencing as part of that. Um, and also, probably not entirely by design um, and influenced by COVID and other factors that led to the writing of the book to be a bit of a longer activity than we originally had thought. Um, but the book has landed just at the point at, this, at which the scheme is now considered fully rolled out. Um, and we think it's timely to sort of pause and reflect on um, now that the focus is sort of off that, let's get this scheme rolled out. Um, and the, the challenge ahead is now, well, how do we make how do we make this work and how do we make um, the, the sort of implementation of the scheme match what was originally designed for it. So um, I, I did want to give a little bit of an overview of some of the uh, part one chapters um, and one of the biggest questions that we kind of grapple with and that I'm sure um, many on the call today would know a fair bit about is what actually is the NDIS as a scheme. Um, and to do this, what I thought I would do is reflect on what the scheme was designed to be like. So how it was described in the original Productivity Commission report and some of the principles that informed that design. So what were the sort of philosophies that sat behind some of the features of the way that the scheme was designed? So in, in its broadest possible sense, the NDIS is an entirely new system of disability support services. And that system hands over what was traditionally a state government responsibility of providing support services or purchasing support services for people with disability and creates that as an almost entirely Commonwealth government operational responsibility. Um, and this was achieved firstly through a series of trial sites that were either in certain geographic locations or for particular age cohorts of individuals that were then transitioned to new trial sites until eventually the scheme was operational across all jurisdictions and for all people who would eventually be found eligible for the scheme. It's, it's now kind of reached that full implementation point. Um, and the actual scheme itself, the intention of the support that would be available through the scheme 
is summarised in that left hand picture there of the three circles. Um, and I think we wanted to reflect on this today because so far, a lot of the media and the conversation about the NDIS is really concerned with that very middle circle, which is the tier three supports. And those are the supports that are the funded support services that are accessible through the NDIS. So they are the, um, the actual NDIS providing direct support or providing in-kind support for individuals who have um, a disability which is both significant and has a, um, a permanent impact on, on their lives. Um, and for those people, the, the, what the scheme is essentially providing is a support plan that they have a role in helping to develop and funding for that plan, which that person can then take to service providers, often non-government service providers, and purchase the, the supports that they need. What is sort of less um, emphasised and talked about, but was actually a very big feature of how the scheme was originally designed, are those tier two and tier three supports. So tier two was intended to be this information capacity building and linkage sort of service that sat around the individualised funded support packages and was available to a much broader range of people. So anybody who identified as having a disability could come and receive that support. And it kind of came in two bits. There was a, um, a role that that tier two support would play in helping people with disabilities access and build their own capabilities to access services outside of the NDIS, so sort of housing or mental health services or health services, so that they potentially need um, less funded support eventually through the scheme, um, but also that this tier two would play a role in creating inclusive services and creating inclusive communities outside of um, funded supports. So the idea was that um, the NDIS would also play a role in helping to create services outside of itself that were inclusive and um, supportive of people who have disabilities. And then the, the final tier there, which is a sort of um, insurance aspect of the scheme, is that it was intended to offer every Australian, like, like any insurance scheme would, this peace of mind that um, just like any kind of car insurance or um, health insurance scheme, where even if you never claim from the scheme, so even if you never receive any benefits through it, the scheme's entitlement aspect, so the fact that you will get support if you meet a certain eligibility threshold means that you can kind of rest assured that if yourself or a family member um, acquires a disability that you'll get the support that you need um, and that you won't be left sort of financially destitute or, or ruined is the is the sort of philosophy and intention of that um, that band of support. So I've sort of touched on a few of these themes here already but what what what's so different about the NDIS from what was around before. And these are certainly aspirations. So these were um, how it was designed to be different. I think implementation tells us a bit of a different story about some of these, um, but essentially it was intended to be an, an entitlement based scheme. So anybody who meets the eligibility threshold for a tier three individualized plan would be entitled to reasonable and necessary support. And, and that's quite different from what was previously operating for a lot of state and territory governments, which was this capped system, which is effectively the budget gets decided at the start of the year. That budget is often based on what the previous year's budget was indexed a bit. It, it often bore very little relationship to the level of need that was actually in the community. Um, and was uh, influenced uh, often by sort of political decision makings and the budget priorities of that year. And what that effectively meant was that you had a fixed bucket of money. And when that money ran out, there would, there'd be no more funds for, for new um, people who might need support. Um, and it created this quite perverse system in a lot of cases where there was a real onus on individuals and families to, to uh, prove how disabled they were and to really emphasise the, the sort of negative aspects, which is the opposite of what the NDIS was set up to do, which was to be a sort of strengths based um, scheme. Um, and, and what this also meant was that only people who 
were sick or unwell enough could actually access support. Um, and people who might benefit from su some support now um, might not get that support until it gets particularly um, challenging to, um, to sort of uh, live a good life, which is not the sort of, sort of creates a perverse incentive that was um, not necessarily intended. Um, the second aspiration there about the scheme was that it, would, it will offer more choice and control. And that's both through the individualised planning process. So um, giving people more of a say in the goals that they set and in the services that they get to support those goals. But also this, um, what sometimes um, people describe as a sort of marketization of the services system where suddenly the individual has the funding, has the funding and they can decide which providers um, are their service providers. And if they don't like certain providers, then they can pick their funds elsewhere. Um, the, the final sort of third box right there is about um, how the scheme is funded and the funding of the NDIS is quite different from how funding for disability support services had previously been allocated. Um, it takes some ideas from the insurance industry in the sense that it attempts to um, estimate the lifetime costs of providing certain types of services and supports for people and that as new people enter the scheme, uh, this roles of scheme actuaries sort of estimates the cost of, of the lifetime cost of support for, for that individual. And in doing that, you, could, you have a much better understanding of what the year on year costs of the scheme are likely to be but also it creates this incentive to invest in expensive um, services up front if, it, if we know or if it can be shown that that will reduce the sort of lifetime cost of care, which creates this sort of early intervention incentive that perhaps wasn't there previously. And then the final two boxes there, um, the, the corporate governance model um, is really just to say that the NDIS was set up to be administered by an independent ish statutory authority, the National Disability Insurance Agency. And that was to sort of keep it um, somewhat arm's length from government um, and to establish it with a board that would be responsible for the quality and for the financial sustainability of the scheme as well. And finally, the last box there is about national consistency. So uh, for the first time, a single scheme, a single system operates across all jurisdictions in Australia. And the idea is that you can move from remote WA to inner city Melbourne and you keep your plan. You don't have to then sort of reprove your eligibility or re-establish your, your need for supports. Um, so this is a very high level and quick attempt to summarise what is a very um, rich and detailed series of chapters about um, how the scheme is actually going and how implementation is working for particular cohorts. Um, I'll not go through each of these in detail, um, save to say that I think the NDIS challenges are often what occupies a lot of the dialogue around the scheme at the moment. And a lot of the media that you see around the NDIS um, focuses on that right hand column. I think what Vary and I found through the book process and was certainly reflected through a lot of the chapters is that there are um, benefits that have come along with the scheme and that we probably, um, we shouldn't be too hasty to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. So in terms of the, the overarching things that the scheme has brought, there, there is this unprecedented level of entitlement to services that hasn't existed before and nearly double as many people are now getting some form of support, disability support services through the NDIS, that um, so half of those would never have received any um, disability support services before, which is pretty um, profound. And um, Vary and I can't quite believe that it's actually that governments, not just the federal government, but every state and territory government has agreed to effectively double the amount of funding in the system for this. Um, and while there are a large minority for whom the NDIS is not working very well at all, there is uh, 
good experiences coming out for many participants that is sort of reflected in some of the information that's starting to come out through the scheme around people's satisfaction with the scheme compared to what was around before. That might tell you something about um, the quality of the service systems that were around before the NDIS, but certainly we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the scheme has um, produced good experiences for many participants. In terms of the, the challenges ahead, um, many of the chapters have highlighted that for some participants, the NDIS is either just as good or um, not as good, or in some cases much worse than what was happening before. Um, and it is often people who are particularly vulnerable or who have complex um, interacting um, service needs that mean that they're getting services from many different service systems. Um, and also the scheme has not been working particularly well for people with intellectual disability and people with psychosocial disability as well. Um, the other element of this that I just wanted to highlight before I'll hand over to Bari to talk through her chapter is um, what we are learning about personalization through the scheme. So individualized services that are sort of tailored to individual needs and also involve the person in the decision making about their, their planning and their services is really in its infancy through the scheme. And we're seeing that work um, quite well for people who have a very clear idea of what they want and what they need and um, are fairly competent in navigating complex bureaucracies. For people who don't have that, it is proving um, pretty insufficient and that there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that this individualised model can work for everybody, including those who don't necessarily have um, a very clear concept of, of what it is that they want or need support to articulate those goals as well. So thank you. Um, I will hand over to Bari now and happy to take questions at the end of the presentation as well. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Um, so what I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on, um, and I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, is a bit of a taster for one of our chapters within the book. Um, so as I mentioned before, my background, before going into public policy, um, I worked on the, the concepts and theories about why children have rights and how that applies in public policy settings. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about children within the NDIS and I'm going to focus more at the conceptual level rather than the actual experiences of children um, within the NDIS, though I will mention a little bit at the end about some of the implementation challenges um, that we have. Um, so Claire, if you could move to the next slide. So if we think about children, um, Sorry, just seems to have <laughs> paused. That's okay. Right. So if we think about children um, and who they are, um, so the easiest way to think about children is that children are young people under the age of 18. Um, you know that that's that's a definition that most countries use use that's the definition that the UN um, Convention on the Rights of the Child use it's the definition that the NDIS uses um, but it's really important to know that children are not just defined by a certain age bracket but by the normative value that we ascribe to them so um, we think about children not as just a distinct category of, um, of people bound by age, but as a category of people that have throughout history had a different moral status. So um, some of the misconceptions that we um, ascribe to children are often shared by society's view of people with disability. So we often take a broad view of children being human beings that lack capacity um, and agency or the competence to be able to make individual Individual decisions or to participate within those sort of very um, entrenched liberal notions of um, what it means to be an agent or to be a right holder. Um, and we often participate in the kind of language and um, normative value that creates sort of an otherness when we think about children. 
Um, so a lot of the history of how people with disability have been treated uh, throughout philosophy, but also by governments, um, is very similar to the way that we think about children as not being the sort of free will holding adults that are in control of our lives, that have um, absolute capacity uh, to make um, de decisions. Uh, so there are a lot of parallels there in terms of the way that we think um, about children and the, the way that public policy has been trying to centre um, policy around children, both within the child protection space and others, um, around child-centred approaches um, and that kind of personalised approach uh, to public policy making has been something that a lot of other services have been um, trying to do in recent years as well. So um, when we think about it from that perspective, there seems to be some opportunity to be able to learn from what the NDIS is thinking and doing um, when they think about how to work in a personalised and individualised way with um, people who may have diminished um, decision-making capabilities. Um, what can we learn from them about how we work with children in other settings as well, but also that potentially there's a better way to think about the participation of um, children within the um, NDIS if we're already coming at it from a different point of view. So if you can move to the next slide, Claire. So the NDIS really then, um, in terms of some of the concepts that Claire laid out before, um, in theory should present an opportunity to radically reimagine what capacity means. Um, so children primarily come into the NDIS through the early intervention pathway. That usually means that they have um, an easier time of it than, um, than NDIS participants that come through the, um, the adult pathway in being able to not have the same uh, threshold of having to demonstrate uh, permanency with disability. There is a high number of children that have entered the scheme. So in a lot of places, um, it's over sort of 50% of NDIS participants that are children. Um, and there seems to be an opportunity here. So the NDIS, uh, as Claire outlined, it really shifts the presumption of incapacity for people with disability and starts with the presumption of capacity and competence. So the NDIS, at least in theory, um, says that everyone who is an NDIS participant, is, they own their plan. They're the ones that should be making the decisions about what's in their plan. Um, if appropriate, they should be allowed the um, ability to make decisions about how to exercise um, and the services within that plan. And that the role of the NDIA and other support services is to wrap around that person, work with their family and carers in order to enable and support that individualized um, decision making and um, really live that concept of choice and control. Um, so conceptually it asks us to place the person with the disability at the centre and I think in a lot of ways challenges these sort of liberal notions of capacity and competence um, and the centrality of capacity and competence within a person's moral status as a right holder. So a lot of the, um, the later latter um, rights movements have said the traditional view of um, someone who is, has the moral status of a right holder is only someone who has got free will, who can make decisions for themselves and that's relegated some um, people with disability, it's relegated children and animals and other um, groups into this sort of other non-right holding capacity category. And the NDIS, at least in theory, is asking us to say, no, we need to start from the position of recognising everyone, all NDIS participants as right holders. Um, so if you can move on to the next one. So it's all great in theory, um, but unfortunately when we think about children and the way that has played out in terms of the NDIS legislation, the NDIS um, hasn't been able to capitalise on a, that opportunity. So um, while there's a presumption of competence um, for adults with a disability who are NDIS participants and then you work from there to um, ask questions about whether other decision-making mechanisms such as guardianship or nominee arrangements are needed. Uh, the exact opposite exists for children. So um, NDIS participants under the age of 18 are automatically appointed to child representative and in most cases this is their parents. Um, 
this can be changed. So the CEO of the NDIA can make a determination that a child representative is not needed and that child um, can make the decisions for themselves. But the important point here is that we're flipping the, the status quo that you're starting with. You're starting with the assumption that they can't and then you need to prove that they can rather than starting with the presumption that no, you're the person that makes decisions for your life and then putting in arrangements where you think that that's not appropriate. It's also really um, interesting to note that the original Productivity Commission report frequently conflated the choices and decision making of children with a disability with the choices and decision making of their parents. So um, the PC report is very nuanced in some respects. When it comes to discussion of children, um, there's just sort of this blanket assumption that um, that the role of the parent and the role and the, of the child are the same, um, which we know can be very problematic at times. Um, so within the current NDIS rules, there are some restrictions in the role of the child representative, um, which provides some sort of best practice guidelines for how decisions making um, regarding a child who's an NDIS participant need to, um, need to happen. And they largely follow the, the principles that are laid out in the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child around best interests um, and making best endeavours to seek the views of the child and then making decisions in line with their views. Um, but they are very high level um, and there hasn't been a lot of thinking around how to how that actually sort of works in practice. Um, and we hear a lot from um, families uh, with parent and parents of children with disability that that um, that blurry line between their role and the role of the child can be incredibly difficult when dealing with the NDIS. Um, go to the next slide. Thanks, Claire. So. Um, it's always good to think about some counter arguments. So when you think about why it is that um, children within the NDIS uh, start from the point of um, assuming incompetence rather than assuming competence, um, one counter argument um, to changing this might be that it's very clear that very young children, such as newborns, don't have the capacity to make choices. So where it may not be clear for some um, participants with disability around their capacity, we can make a pretty obvious assumption that very young children and newborns aren't going to be able to articulate their preferences and participate in decision making. The other argument that um, we've heard is that the risk of denying rights to make your decisions about your own life to children, it's lower than denying them to adults because children age out of this um, non-right holder um, cohort. So you might be denying the rights of a 16 year old to make decisions about their life um, when they're completely capable of doing so, but don't worry, you've only got two more years and then you'll be able to do it um, yourself so that we're less worried about um, being able to, you know, make infringe on people's rights in that way. And I think the, the key thing that we I try and draw out within this chapter is that, um, yes, there might be some valid concerns in these, but um, we would argue that we don't need to even engage in these arguments in the first place because um, the NDIS is set up um, in the first, in the, to be able to work with and enable choice and control if taken seriously with adults who have diminished decision-making capacities. Um, and the point, the view that we're we should be taking with this is to treat each participant as an individual, be able to look at the um, capacity, skills and capabilities. They have the support that they have around them in terms of their family, um, friends and carers and what additional supports and services they need to be able to participate fully um, and have that agency. So for me, the, the obvious question is why aren't we taking the same approach when we think about um, children with disabilities uh, certainly um, it, older children in particular, uh, where there's a lot of research to show that active involvement in the decision making about the services um, that they receive leads to much better outcomes um, in the long term. And particularly if we're going to invest in um, the way of increasing capability and capacity, which as an insurance scheme, the NDIS should be thinking actively about, uh, then involving um, children in decision making early is a great way to make sure that they're going to be making good decisions um, and decisions that are aligned with their best interests once they turn um, 18. Okay, next slide, Claire. 
there's a big but to all of this. So everything that I've talked about so far is about how the NDIS should operate in theory. But the reality is that what we're seeing on the ground is that the NDIS is not delivering effective supported decision-making services to those that need it. So um, even if we could realise the dream of being able to sort of support um, people with diminished decision-making capacities to participate fully in, in the NDIS, um, that's not happening at the moment, both through the, the support that the NDIA are providing, but also through the, um, the underdeveloped market for um, support coordinators, coordinators and specialist support coordinators um, and the, the changing role of local area coordinators um, within the scheme. Uh, so we really argue at several points throughout the book and the children's chapter is just one example of this is that in order to kind of realize some of these opportunities and benefits, there needs to be a more nuanced, more practiced and resourced approach um, to working with, uh, with people with disability to be able to sort of support that true supported decision-making um, and individualized and personalized approach to service delivery, which is what the, the NDIS is based on um, to begin with. And last slide, I think, Claire. Um, so some kind of concluding thoughts about this. Um, I think uh, the NDIS still presents us with some principles and ways of working that give us insight to how person-centred approaches um, for children might work, even though if it might not be happening in practice, there's a real richness in terms of the, um, the history of the NDIS and the, um, the practice that it's drawing on that, involved, that could um, give us lots of opportunities to think about how we work with children um, and children with disability in other contexts. But really the NDIS has missed a trick here by introducing a blanket assumption of incompetence for child participants. Um, and if we're gonna take that individualized approach seriously, there's no reason why we can't be working with a 14 year old with a disability in a individualized way to talk, to think about where they have the capacity to make decisions where they don't, where we can support them in the same way that we would work with an adult. Um, and then finally, really um, a bit of a theme throughout the whole book, um, and one that certainly comes out here is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, to go forward from here. Um, the cookie cutter approach of thinking the, through the NDIS in terms of this is what's gonna work for um, everyone has not played out. And we're seeing that really acutely with some um, people uh, at the moment the thinking about how the NDIS can be adapted and used and implemented for different cohorts for different disability needs um, in regional areas versus working with children in that kind of nuanced way is something that really um, should be the bulk of the, the work that we're doing as we move into the next phase of the NDIS implementation. So welcome back. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. David Trainer, who is an associate uh, at the University of Tasmania in the School of Humanities um, and did a PhD there a number of years ago um, and holds a very senior role in the International LASH Communities Organisation and has been talking about social inclusion and relationships of people with intellectual disabilities um, for many, many years. So he's going to talk about his, his new book called Still in the Underground, why the social inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities remains an elusive goal in neoliberal societies. He's gonna break the rules in a sense and not use slides. Um, and he has a lovely Irish accent. So I hope he's gonna be able to talk fairly slowly and be understandable. Um, so over to you, David. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, certainly my apologies for um, not having slides. Maybe it's the philosopher in me who likes to think differently. So um, I look forward to receiving some feedback. So again, thanks for the invitation and thanks to Dave for coordinating this se seminar. I'm speaking from the land of the Yaya Barong people, who are the traditional owners in the greater Bendigan region that I'm living on today. Today, I pray my respects to their leaders and elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the tradition 
and the culture and the hopes of all the Yaya Barong people. So my purpose in writing the book is to explore why after 50 years of deliberate the institutionalization and our community integration and inclusion programs, persons living with the experience of intellectual disability remain excluded or marginalized from the Western society they live in. Most of the examples I draw upon to substantiate my argument come from persons who live in Australia, one democratic liberal, neoliberal society with a raft of politically congruent and disability sensitive legislation, a policy that utilizes a market based model to fund and administer the reasonable and necessary needs of people living with the experience of disability. One immediate objection that my argument might encounter for example, from some philosophers, is that while persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability might share species membership with other humans persons. However, their limited cognitive capabilities and other such differences remove such persons from the criterion of personhood. So why bother with this research? A fundamental proposition that lies at the heart of this book is that a person who lives with the experience of an intellectual disability is first and foremost a person quo person, that is, regardless of ability, age, gender, culture, or ethnic background, each human being is a person since each person shares a common humanity. That is, a vulnerability that emanates from our finite, finite status and our desire to live interdependent and flourishing life. As a person, we are not static. We continually grow, develop, and deteriorate through our years, and we all benefit emotionally, moral, and psychologically if we experience a range of educational and social opportunities that are non, non, normative to the culture in which we live in. The tragedy is that some persons are not provided with these opportunities. My argument draws upon a number of critical theorists to demonstrate how a negative paradigm prevails towards persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability. At an aggregate level, how such persons are perceived by others and are engaged with by persons living without the experience of intellectual disability, service systems and institutions rarely embraces persons as competent citizens with something positive to contribute to society. One explanation to this phenomenon that occupies this book is the philosophy of personalism, a theory that emphasizes the significance, uniqueness and inviability of the person, as well as the person's essentially relational or social dimension. I am mostly using the personal philosophy that animated in the late 19th and early 20th century from the priority that was being attributed to a set of emerging values, ideas, and structures in Western societies that a range of philosophers believes were having an adverse effect upon the human person and the society they lived in. There are scholars who have traced personal philosophy back to Indian and ancient Greek philosophy. The value of personalism is that questions the obscured personhood of persons living with the experience and intellectual disability that is inherent in the policies of social inclusion and erases questions and challenges these comfortable assumptions. A subtitle of the book is Invading Consciousness, and I take this term from John McMurray, a Scottish personal philosopher, to refer to what I perceive to perceive of what has occurred for persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability. Persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability in the majority of Western nations are living in local communities. Regardless of the circumstances of these living arrangements, the assimilation process for persons living with an intellectual disability is different when compared to other persons as their peers. I may not be saying anything new here to many people, so please let me indulge for a few minutes. When new persons become part of a local community, we tend to notice these persons as our neighbours and we speak to each other. If we are engaged with local shops, we develop relationships with the proprietors and generally we participate together with others in the local community, maybe through playgrounds, churches, sports centres or other such communal venues. If you like, the new neighbours become aware of the new surroundings and neighbours become aware of each other. We mostly develop a more meaningful relationship as we establish who are the persons we share similar interests with. We, um, if there is symmetry to our beliefs, activities and feelings, we develop friendships that extend over many years. This, I argue, has not occurred for persons living with intellectual disability, despite being in geographic proximity to other persons. 
One reason Australia might be the regulatory framework, for instance, the need to conduct risk assessments, has this need for neighbourless been identified through personal planning? Is it reasonable and necessary need? How can NDIS screening issues be managed? And, and can we assess whether organisational public liability policies will, co will cover potential harms? One further reason why this might have failed to occur at a systemic level has been the lack of effective education programmes targeted at developing meaningful social relationships between all infants, children and young persons commencing in childcare settings and extending through formative educational, social and recreation environments. This has an enormous, an enormous consequence for everyone. This includes envisioning a person living with the experience of intellectual disability as having needs that exclude a focus on competency, human development, personal flourishing and diverse personal relationships. The results, however, see such persons being continually ostracised from normative rhythms of life enjoyed by persons living without the experience of an intellectual disability. Thus, while some persons living with an intellectual disability might be noticed at times and engaged within some settings, most persons living without the experience of intellectual disability have not engaged their consciousness, that is, being aware of the needs of other persons and importantly having the desire to see such persons as living, flourishing life. In addition, in addition to philosophical theory, with Egeris Fong, Chris Bigney and her associates, Julia Christopher, Michel Foucault, Irvin Goffman, Eva Feta Kide, Hans Reinders, Wolf Wolfensbergers are some of the scholars I draw upon to add context to the global neoliberal neo societies we live in, the actual lives lived by persons living with the experience and intellectual disability, and the institutional dynamics that permeate our lives. After an overview of the personal theoretical framework, I need to present some evidence that persons are indeed excluded and live at the margins of neoliberal societies. The social theorist hypothesis I'm indebted to are embedded in their texts. So from chapter three, I focus on how persons living with the experience and intellectual disability continue to remain excluded from their communities in neoliberal Western societies. After a brief overview of the progression of the theoretical basis of the institutionalization and contemporary inclusion programs in disability services, I present research findings on the employment and social relation networks for persons living with the experience of intellectual disability. In studies in the UK, Ireland and Canada, findings reveal that such persons rarely secure paid employment and if persons are successful, a UK study in 2019 discovered that persons were paid 12% less than their peers. In the same year in Ireland, the participation rate in the generic employment market for such persons aged between 60 and 64 was 6.6%, compared to 54% of persons living without the experience of intellectual disability. These findings are echoed in Australia in 2017 by Gouling, Anderson and McVilly. I also present some findings from the education system on how students are engaged in learning. As I'm sure many researchers here better than myself know, students are not actively engaged in academic learning. One research finding revealed that the assimilation seemed to be flawed at all levels. It is a form of genocide that depicts legitimacy of differences and which falls on its own academic sword. For most of us, one common feature of living a meaningful social life is personal friendships and social relationships in which as participants, we are able to choose to engage in enjoyable and meaningful activities that strengthen the relationship and supports or creates emotional and reciprocal bonds with other persons. Research finding from studies of friendship of persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability indicates that persons have a dirt of personal relationships. Persons are lonely and isolated from other members of society. Researchers have identified three dimensions of loneliness to reflect the particular type of relationships that are missing in personal lives. First, intimate and or emotional, which is, loneliness, which is a loneliness that is longing for a close, confident or an intimate partner, a person with whom you can share a deep mutual bond of affection and trust. Second, a relational or social loneliness is the yearning for quality friendships and social companionship and support. Finally, Collective loneliness is the hunger for a network of persons who share your sense of purpose and interests. 
these three dimensions together reflect the full range of high quality social connections that human persons need in order to thrive. I've drawn upon the works of such scholars as Bigney and Riesel, Emerson McVilly, Gilmore and Cascali, McLaughlin and Company, and Verdeshot and Al to argue that relation policy is the normed experience of most persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability in Western neoliberal societies. One gap I did notice in research on friendships and social network is that I could not find any studies that focus on whether persons living with the experience of intellectual disability were, were either invited or invited friends, peers and non-peers, to their homes for dinner or other social events. This for me is a form of intimate and social relation. If this is a mutual activity, regular experience by persons, then it might serve to contest the above forms of loneliness. However, for now, I'll argue that without such evidence, most parents experience all three forms of loneliness, intimate, relation, and collective. I therefore, therefore propose that the term ostracized other or the social prior other is the most appropriate and accurate way of describing persons' emotional, social, and recreational living sexuality in Western societies. I use an accepted model adopted from continental philosophy by Critchley of critique, prax, and emancipation to critically explore the dominant philosophical values that stand behind the economic and social paradigms that influence and control the lives of persons living with an intellectual disability in Western society. Critique refers to the detailed assessment and analysis of a social practice or prax using history, culture, and tradition in such a way that it demolishes what is perceived as knowledge and best practice for an existing or social practice. The purpose of crit critique is that the existing practices are unjust and unable to positively influence and impact fully on the social practices. This approach identifies what types of transformation is needed to emancip emancipate the social practice and create something different. This transformation challenges individuals and our collective practice to become emancipated or liberated from the unjust practice to conceive new possibilities. The desired outcome is to improve individual lives. This model assesses the features of neoliberalism and, and analyzes if disability services are institutionalized, albeit in a modern way, with particular emphasis on the national disability insurance scheme and what values are promoted in Western societies. The finding of Prax revealed that A, there has been a move away from congregate and geographic isolated locations and institutionalized structures towards smaller community living options for persons living with the experience of intellectual disability. The current emphasis on person-centered planning is good news for individuals. However, the implementation of such strategies appear to be deficient and lacking integrity. I suggest that the research confirms what many of us might know that planning and prioritizing personal needs has yet to become part of the cultural fabric of funders and service providers. The lives of the majority of persons living with experience of intellectual disability are increasingly institutionalized since the locus of power and control remains with government, family members, and service providers. The economic and political ideology used to fund and administer interna inter international public policies on social inclusion overlook core personalist, personalist philosophical values such as interdependence and the idea of a common good. I've also explored how normative cultural practices interact with the policy of social inclusion and suggest a rationale for this phenomenon. I argue that Cultural practices maintain a fundamental understanding of intellectual disability and show how this is preserved through for cause concept of biopower. Biopower refers to the disciplinary authority that takes charge of the two poles that Foucault argues regulate human life, the physical body as a machine and the biological organism and population as a species body. Foucault argues that biopower develops as an institutional framework and becomes a set of social practices and is through everyday sanctioned process and activities that a normality develops that in turn becomes an accepted prax. The new practices quickly become accountable for constructing persons in particular ways who are acted upon and forced into lower, typically negative roles for the predictable and efficient conduct of society. <clears throat> 
This form of cultural dominance serves to inhibit persons living with the experience of intellectual disability to realize personal goals of social inclusion. If we as a society can extend our minds and preconceived notions and move beyond normative cultural myths, this is a form of emancipation. This proposal incorporates vulnerability as a central feature of humanism, challenges the notion of a person as conceived in a neoliberal paradigm and offers an alternative vision of society. The dominant culture in Western nations is neoliberalism, which emphasizes the philosophical values of independence, autonomy, and a market-based approach to providing social services. The theoretical value of such an approach is to focus on person-centered care and personalized or individualized financial resource all allocation. Nevertheless, the philosophical values can easily become distorted or skewed. They can be distorted since culture and its nexus with the nature of intellectual disability, the concept of social inclusion, and how these impact upon the marketplace. Biopower, biopower impacts upon persons and the marketplace negatively. This and previous chapters have highlighted the failure of neoliberalism to engage with culture, social policies, and implement the values that are proposed to hold. The penultimate chapter offers a critique of inclusion through a focus of, on belonging and argues that a focus on creating social, emotional, and physical spaces of encounter for persons living with and persons living without the experience of intellectual disability will more appropriately serve the goals of social policies of inclusion. There is a chasm that is increasing the ways these cohorts live their lives and it is widening every day. The danger is that while persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability may have a physical presence in the community, persons are becoming increasingly economically, socially, emotionally and politically isolated through current policies. For instance, what political forms attempt to include the voice of a person living with the experience of an intellectual disability? How can persons be supported to have their opinions listened to by mainstream politics? Any methodology that aspires to meet social inclusion goals needs to incorporate recognized human development frameworks and the social model of disability. The final chapter offers suggestions on how a person's approach might direct the activities that provide support services to people living with the experience of intellectual disability. My suggestion focuses on divergence between the interrelationship in theory, practice, action, reflection, self, and community. The difficulty with any, suggest, any suggested strategies is, of course, that they by themselves can become institutionalized also immediately and, and can then quickly become the problems of tomorrow. All systems are susceptible to biopower. Disability practitioners, scholars, and others continue to seek new approaches to improve the lives and ways persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability can engage with other persons and their communities. These can have merit, and I do not want to detract from any systems that are enable persons living a fulfilled life, or indeed who are meaningfully engaged in social, economic, relational, and political spheres of life. So to conclude, there are some positive changes that have occurred in the way persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability. In many circumstances, persons are now viewed as persons quo person. In addition, the manner in which Western governments respond to personal needs has experienced structural change since the 1950s and which contribute to more humane living conditions for many persons. The voices of persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability are increasingly emerging in the contemporary discourse. And while we as society have not always been faithful to listening to such persons, I argue we need to pay greater attention to self-advocacy service and structured consultation forums to further this momentum and build upon the neoliberal concept of user participation. In my analysis, I've tried to include the voice of the person living with an intellectual disability, though I have failed in many areas. Applying rigor, a sense of realism and honesty to social policy of inclusion principles can be realized if, as I suggest, the key characteristic of personalism dominate our personal, economic, cultural, political, and societal ways of engaging persons living with the experience of an intellectual disability. These characteristics are the cornerstone importance of the quality of relationships and social well-being. The pursuit of relationship is a rock bottom fundamentally of human well-being, as Seligman argues. A particular concern for persons who might experience disadvantage either relationally and or materially.
the family is a primary foundation space where persons can experience love and support from other persons. In grounding oneself in neighborhoods, villages, and cities, since this will build relationship amongst persons as a community and within the community as a whole. Sharing power, consultation, and slow decision making as the most effective forms of organizational accountability. A commitment to acting with justice in the broad sense of the term and working towards reconciliation in personal, institutional, and political spheres when injustice has occurred. Using financial and other resources to strengthen and enrich robust personal, commercial, social, and political relationships. Prioritizing the importance of persons, sustaining personal and social relationships, and paying attention to the interrelationship and welfare of all persons. As we enter the third decade of the 21st century, we need persons living with and persons living without the experience of intellectual disability to embrace a new mantle of leadership and offer societies a vision of what a flourishing life can look like. There are certainly academic and practitioners working towards this goal, and I'm sure there are many persons attending this seminar with this goal in mind. Let's find a way to work together in our personal and professional relationship, which enhance each other's well-being and dignity.